That was very nice. Thank you, Daniel. And good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Arts Echo Neighborhood Association's first mayoral candidates forum. Uh, and our forum is being recorded, so that we, we ask now that you kindly silence your phones. And uh, my name is Irene Bigger, the president of our association, and along with our vice president, Jane Krupp, and our secretary, Lindsay Kazel Farrington, as well as our directors, Eugene Rodriguez and Nina Wirth, We'd like to thank you all for participating in this public debate forum. We would like to also thank Daniel, Seraldo, and the MDPL staff for the generosity and support of this gathering. For those that were not with us at last week's forum, there are certain points and facts that are worth repeating. ADNA represents roughly 854 registered voters in our defined area, which is in the Art Deco Cultural District from 15th Street to the north side of 5th Street and the ocean to both sides of Washington Avenue. Adding in the direct areas from 3rd Street to 16th Streets, we have an additional 475 registered voters, totaling to 1,329 voters that surround Lummis Park in districts 41, 42, and 43. We created our neighborhood association this year as we felt that residents who live and vote in the MXC ADCD were underrepresented in our city government and needed a means to be heard. And so we formed our nonprofit association. The entertainment district, MXC, the strip, ground zero for crime and chaos, whatever our relatively small part of the island is called, we send a powerful message via social media and the news that seeps out and overshadows the entire global brand of Miami Beach. What happens on Ocean Drive does not stay on Ocean Drive. Residents here and throughout the city are prepared and committed to participate in and inspire change in Miami Beach. The city often cites consultation with stakeholders in determining recommendations to our elected officials. Residents, too, are the stakeholders. And though we are a large group, somehow our needs get lost and are unaddressed. Our mayor is the nonpartisan chief executive of the municipal government of Miami Beach, who chairs the meetings of the seven-member city commission. Despite having one equal vote, we look to the new mayor to be a leader for change and someone who will be accessible to us to ensure that residents are heard and our needs are brought into balance with the existing commercial monoliths in the ADCD. We do expect transparency and accountability from our chief executive, from our entire city commission, as well as all of the elected officials, committee members, city employees, and staff. Again, what happens on Ocean Drive does not stay on Ocean Drive, and we have so much potential to do better. The format for this evening will be as follows. We have four candidates for mayor seated in alphabetical order by last name, and we will rotate through this order to allow each candidate to have the ability to be the first and the last to answer each question. The first segment will allow each candidate one minute to introduce themselves. The second segment will consist of direct questions that candidates will have up to two minutes to respond to, again in rotated order. Then we will have a lightning round where each candidate will have 30 seconds to respond to each question. And the third segment will allow each candidate one minute for closing words. We will conclude our forum with an opportunity for our audience to mingle with the candidates. So without further ado, please help me welcome our candidates for Mayor of Miami Beach, Michael Gongora, Michael Grieco, Stephen Miner, and Bill Rohde. <laughs> Beginning with our first segment, could each of you please take one minute to introduce yourselves? Lindsay in the audience will signal a 30 second warning card and Jay next to me will sound an alarm when time is up. 
So let's begin with Mr. Gungora. <laughs> Thank you, Irene, and welcome everybody this evening. I'm Michael Gungora. I'm excited to be running for mayor. I'm the most experienced candidate for the role. I'm also the person who's lived here the longest and accomplished the most of the candidates. I had the pleasure of being elected three times to serve on the city commission between 2006 and 2021. I accomplished many things from the creation of the sustainability committee to passing our stormwater master plan to keep our city dry to actually placing the items to renew the lease on this building that we're all sitting in tonight so that MDPL could continue to be here. I'm excited to work with this resident group as I am all resident groups in our city. I am, am I at 30 seconds? All right, I'm at 30 seconds, everybody. By trade, I am a condominium lawyer. I've actually worked with some of the buildings in the area, I'm board certified by the Florida Bar. And I'm also the only candidate that served on all three of the city, of the commission committees, finance, land use, and neighborhoods. Public safety is my number one issue, resident quality of life, and making sure that the city moves forward with stormwater mitigation. Thank you all for your attention. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening, everybody. I'm Mike Rico. I live about nine and a half blocks that way. I'm the proud father of a 14-year-old going to Beach High. Uh, I've lived in South Beach now since 1999. My first apartment was at Fifth and Meridian, and uh, worked my way up over the years. Six years as a prosecutor, four years as a commissioner, proudly four years as a state representative, which plays probably the most important role in a lot of what we're going to be talking about tonight. Because every time somebody's going to make a promise tonight about what they're going to do, the state legislature can stop them from doing it. So the power that I have is that I have the relationships and the know-how. When the state legislature starts coming down on us, I know who to call, how to call, and how to get around Tallahassee to make sure that the state legislature is not taking our local control away from us, especially when it comes to development in this area. My name is Mike Rico, and I'm running for mayor. Hi, I'm Stephen Miner, current commissioner since 2019. Thank you all for electing me. I am a current uh, attorney with the United States Securities and Exchange Commission. I work in enforcement. And then my family, lovely family, is here. My wife, my two kids. My parents are residents of Miami Beach as well. I've been at the forefront of every major resident focused issue since 2019 when I was elected and nothing more than policing and crime and prosecution in our judicial system. I transformed our city prosecution program too long to get into, but we were at 8% 8, 8 success rate of convictions back in 2021 and we're near 90% today. When bail reform was being proposed, I was the first one to expose it and then worked hard to defeat it. And it goes on and on. I'm a supporter of 2 a.m. And it's because, not that that is the magic bullet, but I believe it's a, an aspect of turning around what's become in our city and also transforming our city into that arts and culture destination that we're really trying to make our city. Is that the buzzer? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I don't think the, the wire stretches this, this long, so this is very symbolic. I'm on the outside. <laughs> And these are the politicians. Okay. So I am your candidate of change. And you talk about a new leader and change, that's me. The biggest risk for Miami Beach of all the challenges we face is if we stick with the old politics and the old politicians and expect a different result. Not going to happen. I'm the change candidate. My slogan, action with integrity. Actually, we're going to get things done. And integrity, we're going to do it for a change with honesty in this city. I've got a vision, and I look forward to getting into it. I love this neighborhood. We taught our kids to swim here. This is my life. We taught our kids in the playground. This is where we live. Love it here. Yes. You can, Mr. Rowe, you can give it to uh, Mr. Grico. You can give it to Mr. Grico. Moving on to our questions. Two minutes. I will read the question, and each of you will have two minutes for a direct response. Again, we will continue in alphabetical name order and then rotate throughout the candidates. 
And this question goes to Mr. Grieco. The issues we have in the Art Deco Cultural District affect our immediate area and can at times unfairly dictate the identity of all of Miami Beach. Therefore, there have been calls for solutions here that can spread and positively impact our entire island and ultimately our global brand. Mr. Grieco, do you agree with Mayor Gelber's vision shared with us in July of 2020 to rebrand the MXC into the ADCD, the Art Deco Cultural District? And if so, what is your plan to lead the transformation from a hospitality dominated economy to a more diverse live, work, play, balanced global brand? So it's a great question. So I don't think one is separate from the other. We don't have any auto plants or cement factories in the city of Miami Beach. Our brand is hospitality. It may not be late night chaos, or it shouldn't be, but hospitality, food and beverage, entertainment, but also hotels and tourism, we can't deviate from that. That's why people come here. That's why we're able to keep our taxes as low as, as, low as they are, because hospitality is our brand. Chaos should not be our brand. So converting to a more arts and culture-based economy is also important. But it's important, look at what we did. We just passed this bond, $160 million for art and culture. I not only advocated for that bond, I shot commercials for that bond when other people were either hiding or voting against it. But I'll tell you this, that every bad headline that comes out of this neighborhood, it impacts not only our entire city, it impacts the entire county. Most people that don't live, live in South Florida, they don't know the difference between Miami Beach, Miami Dade, it's all a big blend to them. And they all think about Ocean Drive. LeBron was taking his talents to South Beach. I don't think he's ever been to South Beach. The guy moved to the Grove and was playing basketball downtown. But I can tell you this, the live, work, play model that was mentioned in the question, that is not specific to this area. This should be a city-wide vision. Live, work, play. Get people that work here to be able to live here. Get people that live here an opportunity to work here. People complain about traffic. People complain about parking, but at the same time, those two things are a product of the fact that we have too many people working here who don't live here. And we have too many people who live here who work somewhere else. And if we want to reduce that, we want to improve our quality of life, we want to have boots on the ground that have buy-in and have a stake in our community. Over 90% of our city employees don't live in the city of Miami Beach. I can maybe meet two cops that live in the city of Miami Beach, maybe one firefighter who lives in the city of Miami Beach. Almost none of our teachers do. So we need to be focusing on getting these folks living in our city, providing housing opportunities for them, but also providing housing opportunities for the folks who are coming to Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Miner? I do agree that's an absolute fact that what happens here on Ocean Drive and at South Beach has an absolute impact on the rest of our city. We cannot, and I think most people recognize that. You talk to people who live in North Beach or Mid Beach, and they're impacted by what happens in spring break, but it's not just spring break, it's all year round. So how do we change that? How do we get away from that? And there's many different aspects. I mentioned the 2 a.m., I mentioned arts and culture, but it's also incentivizing residential use. So we did, we converted the Marriott Hotel that's now gonna become residential. Not immediately in this area, but there was a, a hot controversial issue with a, a hotel project in Sunset Harbor that I actually was, well, there were four of us who were deciding vote, but I was one of the deciding votes to vote against it. Because the argument is, as much as we can bring residential into this area, the better. We have enough transient use, we have plenty of it. Airbnb is an issue, we just had an incident with Airbnb. I'm actually gonna be, I'm looking to bring legislation to lower the standard that our code uses to enforce against the Airbnb. It's too high. You almost need an admission from somebody to admit that they're violating the law. You don't see that with any other issue. And the bottom line is, we need more police presence, enforcing the law. For example, open drug sales. You can see it here. I have a proposal right now that we should bring our own drug testing lab to Miami Beach. Because right now, a lot of our arrests don't even get tested. And we can't prosecute a case if it doesn't get arrested. I actually made the argument, I was meeting with, with a group of business people, and I actually said to them, it was the Chamber of Commerce, and I actually said to them, I am, and I'm not insulting anybody here because they're not on the current commission, I said, I am the best, most pro-business commissioner you're gonna find. 
Not really. Everyone knows me as the pro-resident commissioner. So why did I say that? Because when you crack down and you have a safe city and a clean city and a well-lit city, you are going to have a better city for residents, and it's going to also be better for our businesses. Everyone wins. It's a, it's a win, and we have to get back to the basics Thank and make that happen. Thank you, Commissioner. So Stephen just said he's the most pro-business commissioner, and I would agree with that. However, I'm the most pro-business mayor candidate. Why? Because I've been a CEO for 30 years. I know how to build a brand. So there's actually, believe it or not, a master plan. And I do agree with Mayor Gilbert. I do believe with it. I don't know if anyone's answered that question, but I agree with the rebranding of Ocean Drive and this whole district all the way to Washington. There is a master plan, and we just have to implement it. It includes 20 million and another 5 million for Loomis Park. 20 million for Ocean Drive alone. Nothing has been done. And this is why I'm running. I want to get things done. And I want to do it in an honest way. And this is what I'm going to do. This is my pledge. I will get things done because I've done it as a CEO. I've done it as a military nuclear missile based commander. And I've done it as a health ambassador. Even if we start small, What's small? We we'll put more lights in the park. Easy to do. We clean up the sidewalks. There's litter everywhere. And we make it safe. That's the most important thing. We can see from our apartment where people have been murdered on Ocean Drive. And that's why they don't come anymore. It's empty. If you walk it today, I guarantee it's virtually empty. It's a narrative that's not only taken hold in our community, it's taken hold worldwide. So the first thing we're going to do, we're going to work with the police, and we're going to make it safe, and then we're going to do all the other things. There's a lot of good things in that plan, and we're going to rebrand it, and it's going to be amazing because we know about branding and we know about marketing, don't we? MTV style. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. They're speaking points and they're getting things done. I've been getting things done on the city commission for years, placing things on the ballot, passing laws that make our city better, increasing the police budget, putting video cameras out on the streets, adding to a real-time crime center and pushing for more lighting. My vision for this area is a clean and safe and wonderful neighborhood where the police are actively, proactively policing on foot and on bicycle and keeping us safe. Where the streets are well lit, not towards the turtles, but towards the other <laughs> side, <laughs> so that we feel safe walking here again. My vision is preserving the beautiful historic preservation and buildings that we fought so hard to keep in our city. But we will improve on them and we will adapt on them. Yes, we must adapt for the future. And how do we do that? We have to encourage residents living in here again. But we can accomplish both. We can accomplish keeping our historic buildings while simultaneously adding for residents to come back and live, work, and play in this neighborhood. And that vision of an Art Deco cultural district, I was on the commission and I voted for it. So I consider it to be part of my vision. And certain seeds have been laid that will grow during my tenure as mayor. Yes, we have a $159 million geo bond to upgrade cultural facilities, including this one that we're standing in. And we will. We will better program this area with limited activations. Don't get scared, ladies. But we will bring in high-end activations that people want. Does anybody remember Pavarotti on the beach many years ago? All right, these are the old timers from the 90s that are here. We will bring in things that people like, art right, Basel, wine and food. I want to bring in a light festival like we see in Laon, France, to light up our historic buildings. And I want to do the kind of things that people want to attend. We can accomplish it. It's at our fingertips. It's a question of who can you trust to get things done. And I have had a tenure of getting things done. Thank you. Commissioner Miner, over the past 20 years, there have been many academic studies that have demonstrated that heritage tourism can generate up to 30% more revenue than any other type of tourism. Will you take the lead in preserving, protecting, and promoting our unique art assets? 
to create a community mobilization strategy that could realize our vision of being the American Riviera? And if so, how? I'm glad you mentioned the American Riviera because I actually mentioned that at a commission meeting a couple of years ago, and that's what I compared it to. But we're not there. We are clearly not there. But how do we get there? So yes, Art Deco architecture, preserving our heritage is key. I don't even think it's a, a no-brainer. I think that's one of the things that our residents, everyone, really, any, everybody up here, our residents were so outraged at the Clevelanders' quote-unquote proposal. I say quote-unquote because there's no proposal. There's nothing actually submitted. It's just a publicity stunt. That's what outraged everyone because it's so out of scale and it really ruins the architecture here. So that is key number one. But how do you bring back? I, I've been saying this, and I've said this publicly at commission meetings. Right now, one of the biggest problems we have here in this area is that people who don't live around here generally don't come here. I talk to my friends or people I meet. I, uh, I always ask questions. People talk, uh, obviously, uh, commissioners, people talk about it all the time. People from Mid Beach and North Beach do not come here generally. That is a problem. If we change that, once we change that, that changes everything. So how do you get there? It's changing the vibe. Some of that, maybe some low scale development issues, maybe combining like the Betsy did, we're combining the alleyways, and you can allow, but again, keeping that Art Deco architecture, but you have to change the current sort of environment. You walk down and the music's blasting, and you have people, and you smell the pop. You smell it when you walk down here. A lot of it, and, and I'm, I'm big on policing and, and enforcement, so there's, there's an aspect of that, but it's not gonna get solved alone, just on that alone. So you have to create that incentives, and, uh, and, and, and probably that scale, low scale development to be able to transform the businesses that are problematic and really preventing the residents from coming here. Because once we get our residents from around the city coming down here, which they really should, because this is, on a good day, this is one of the most beautiful places on earth. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll, re I'll repeat again, because some of our questions are just jam packed with a lot of words. Basically, is as, as uh, we heard from Commissioner Minor, will you take the lead, yes or no? And then if so, how? And again, what's important for us to hear is protecting our unique Art Deco assets and possibly creating a mobilization strategy so that we can in the future realize our, our dream of the American Riviera. Is that for me or for Commissioner? Well, just, just yeah. Okay, just, okay I'll, I'll go first. Yeah. yeah. Life is a balance, we all know that. And we have urban planning and we have development, and that's going to continue, but only smart development. What I like to say, there's 800, 800 buildings, Art Deco buildings in this particular area. There's a couple thousand more to go through on Miami Beach. When I finish my term of mayor, my three terms, I guarantee you there will be 800 buildings still preserved. And that's it. There's no compromise. But now, I will be pleased. We've been positioned a little bit as anti-development because I came out against Five Park. Five Park is not environmentally compatible. I think it was a mistake. We like the park, but not the building. That's the sort of example where we have this culture in City Hall, which is paid for play. It's thick as thieves. Developers have run a month in our city, and we're gonna, that's going to stop. Under my administration, that will stop. We'll have transparency and we'll have honesty, and we're not gonna have, oh, you do this and I will pat you on the back or the influence pedal. No more. And I think that's been, unfortunately, part of the tension that you're seeing between developers and residents. And again, not opposed to smart development, but we make smart development, 30 seconds, I gotcha, 30 seconds to I'll say, smart development is good because we're gonna make that contingent on something that's good for the residents, whether it's affordable housing or doing the 200 and 100 block of Lincoln Road. We have more leverage. We have more leverage than we think for the developers. Everybody wants to be here, so we're gonna make it work for us, the residents. Thank you. Thank you.
thank you. Nobody loves our historic buildings more than I do, and nobody certainly sitting up here has a demonstrated commitment to preserving them. Besides being part of the commission, we created boards that have a lot of say over the types of things that get built. I've sponsored a number of things. One of my last meetings on the commission, I actually sponsored an item to incentivize preservation of historic homes. But what we need to be cognizant of is none of us here can really protect the city adequately from the attacks that we're seeing from the state of Florida. The preemption laws that are attacking our historic buildings must be stopped. And we need a mayor that really has land use experience and legal knowledge to work with our city attorney team on really changing the zoning to try to get ahead of the issue. We really need to work, look at whether we do some type of moratorium or whether we do some kind of down zoning to try to get ahead of the Live Local Act and other state preemptions that are attacking us. And in fact, we may need to band together with other cities in similar situations to us. Coral Gables and Palm Beach clearly come to mind. There's already a proposal on our block at the Clevelander to put up a 30-story building. Of course we're all opposed to that. It's ludicrous. But we need to get ahead of that issue and be ready for it. You have my commitment as mayor that my commission will be focused on this. We will work with our legal team. We will do everything possible simultaneously. We will also go to the state. We will negotiate with the state and we will work with them to preserve our history. And these buildings are our history. And I love it. And it is part of why tourism wants to come here. I love the Art Deco walking tours, which I need to do one again sometime soon. I love the fact that tourists want to come here not just to go to nightlife, to be here during the daytime for our beaches and our beautiful historic buildings. Together, we will fight and we will preserve our history. All right, so we're, we're two questions in, and this is when I'm gonna give you the line. What have you done? What are you going to do? And the last part, which is, how are you going to do it? I'm hearing a lot of platitudes. I'm hearing a lot of, we're gonna go to Tallahassee. And do, most of the people up here have only gone up to Tallahassee maybe once for day days and eat a little paella and then they come home. I know what it's like. I spent four years up there. I came back with relationships that matter. I came back with relationships, not just the current speaker, the future speaker, the current state senate president. These are important relationships. Why? Because these are the folks that I can call privately and say, hey, why are you trying to kill my city? I can show you my text messages. They're pretty bad. And I can tell you this, when the Clevelander proposal came up, who was the one that came running out here and screaming and yelling on social media about it? Me. Before I was testing waters, before I had to check whether or not I took any money from them, which I didn't. But I can tell you this, that we can talk all day about we're going to stand and we're going to fight the developers and we have all the leverage. We don't have any leverage, okay? We don't. Because out of town, multi-billionaire developers who own projects like the Clevelander and other Art Deco projects, they are going to skip over us. We can do whatever we want, but unless we can work with the folks in Tallahassee and have built-in equity with the folks in Tallahassee, most, most of whom, they read the headlines, but they can't hear us. They can't see us. Heritage tourism and what we want to do, rebranding South Beach and this area in particular, is essential for our future. I hope there's some other questions that we can go deeper into this, but I can tell you right now, as we move forward in this forum, what have you done? What are you going to do? And how are you going to do it? I'm not hearing the how part except for me. Thank you. Can you give the uh, microphone to Mr. Kirby? So, so, can I just jump in real quick? Oh, no. You know what? I'll tell you what. You will have the opportunity because the, the third, this third question okay. is somewhat similar, but is not. And again, I just want, I'm going to focus on some of the key words and I'll emphasize them. So, you all mentioned the Clevelander. 30-story tower publicity on Ocean Drive. You mentioned the Resiliency and Safe Structures Act in Tallahassee that threatens our iconic uh, skyline. My question here, question number three, is not only will you, but how would you advocate 
for what residents consider good development. In answering your question, if you can touch on the following three things. Would you limit bar with either a six sevenths or a seven sevenths vote on the commission? Would you consider and focus on repurposing historic structures with creative new uses? And also, again, how will you reach out to state, like state legislators in Tallahassee to protect our historic skyline? Okay. So those three. I'll agree with three, and I'll just say that last choice, all of the above. I would repurpose for sure. And I would work with developers to make sure that it's, there is no hard increase. I can't see any scenario where we would actually increase the height because we already have done it and it's a mistake. So yes, I would, I would not support that. And you know, um, I, I'm sorry to say this, Mike, but where are you? So the reason Mike doesn't have any leverage, he said it, he doesn't have any leverage over developers. He accepts money from developers. That's why. So if you accept money, that's where the whole thing starts. You're beholden. We will, we never have accepted money from a developer, and we never will accept money from a developer. We're not beholden to anyone. That gives us the leverage. That's what leverage is called. That will continue under my administration. Sir, would you clarify? Would you limit, how would you limit the FAR? What, what, are, what are your thoughts? What would you do as mayor? I would vote, I would stick to the current regulation on FAR. And I know there's exceptions often granted, but the community health center is built or a park, like Five Park, or Ritz Carlton is talking about the 100 and 200 block. We have to keep remembering. We have to keep remembering. Everybody wants to be there. This is precious real estate. And yes, we do have leverage, as long as we don't accept money from them. And we can negotiate deals. All right, everybody. The only person that I'm beholden to are the residents of my image. So yes, I will stand up and fight for our community. As to the specific questions, yes, I do support the measure going before the commission to increase it to a 6 7 vote of the commission to approve FAR or FAR. I think it is FAR. But same thing, the floor area ratio. Also, Commissioner Alex Fernandez has sponsored an item that I support and that I've discussed with him about creating a process when people seek the FAR increases so that the city has a way to slow it down and focus on it to send it out to the planning board and the land use committee and public charrettes because we need time to get ahead of this issue. Sometimes it feels like we're under attack from the state. And we need to look at what other communities are doing. Hey, we're, we're not alone in this fight. Doral and Hollywood are dealing with it. The, the commission in Doral declared a moratorium. Maybe that's what we need to do. Maybe we need to downzone this specific district so that everything that exists becomes legally non-conforming and then there's less FAR available. And we do need to have that conversation with our legislators. Our state rep is here tonight. I think we should ask him, please take back the Live Local Act and please help us fight these laws. I would work with them at the state level to try to rescind this. I would also do everything legally possible as mayor with my commission to try to stop this. And this is really where the land use experience comes in. I chaired the Land Use Committee for many years. I'm board certified as a land use attorney, and I'm ready to use that experience for all of you as mayor to preserve this district. Thank you. Mr. Reed. Um, I got called out by name. There we go. All right, so I served on the commission for four years. Do you know how many notable developments at all went up during those four years? Zero, Bill. Zero. What have you done? What I have done is I served on a commission that said no to development, yes on infrastructure. We worked on roads, we worked on parks. The only thing that got developed was the convention center. So it's all about track record. What have you done? What are you going to do? So when the Unsafe Structures Act 
when that was coming through, when they were going to come in, forget the local act, when the legislature was going to come in and say, if you live in a flood zone and your building could not be built today, you could knock it down, forget about historic preservation at all, who was the one reaching out to the individual bill sponsors and talking them off the ledge while the bill was actually in messages? Me. I was the one reaching out to Rep. Roach. I was the one reaching out to Senator Avalon. You want to know why? Because I can call them and they will pick up the phone. They're not going to pick up the phone if you're Joe Blow Mayor that just came in and doesn't know your way to Tallahassee. This is an important piece of the puzzle. We can go six sevens, fine. We can go seven sevens, that's great. Eight sevens if you want to go and stop FAR, that's great. But I'll tell you right now, every time we stick over in the red zone, when we're over here on the wrong end of the we're on the wrong end of the field, there are checks being cut up in the state capitol that will circumvent everything that we are doing. So we can sit here and dig our heels in the sand, or we can be realistic about what we want to do. The Clevelander can't do what they sort of proposed to do recently today. But with one word added to that bill, one glitch bill, add the word intensity instead of density, you could see a 30-story tower starting to get built tomorrow, and there's nothing we can do about it unless you know who to call in Tallahassee and how to get things done. So I'm thrilled we're talking about this increasing the vote from 5-7th Commission to 6 7 to increase the FAR because I'm the sponsor of that legislation, which is coming up, it was actually on the last commission meeting, but we didn't get to it. Which, by the way, gets to an important point. The commission meetings, that's really the power of the, power may not be the right word, of the mayor. The agenda, and also behind the scenes. I've seen it. Administratively, you can pass all the legislation in the world, but it still comes down to implementation. And that's really where the mayor has an outsized voice compared to the commissioners. But getting back to the five sevens. So where did that proposal come from? So the state legislature actually took away the voters' rights in the voter referendum on private property FAR increases. Floor area ratio, the density, height, density. So the Doval, for example, right now, if it went, if the commission approved a project like that, you would not get to decide its fate, and it did fail. So I proposed, in response, that it should be a 6-7 vote of the commission instead of 5-7. And by the way, there are sometimes Usually they don't get up a lot of meat and a lot of attention, but you voted on to approve overwhelmingly a couple of projects last time. They were small incremental changes that are better for the neighborhood, really small. You're almost, they're fairly negligible. But these larger projects that are getting constantly proposed, and you, the voters, have voted down, that's where we need the 6 7 vote. I didn't propose 7 7 because I believe I wouldn't get the votes. I'm not even sure I'm going to get 6 7 under this current commission. Maybe the next commission we will. But seven sevens I felt was not realistic, and so I didn't propose that. By the way, I'll add another one, the bailing. Whether you love the bailing or don't love the bailing, one of the issues that I brought to the forefront was that the county's zoning laws would preempt our zoning in any rapid transit zone. So I have a proposal, I, I actually introduced legislation or resolution that our commission passed that we sent to the county asking us to exempt us from their zoning laws, because if that goes to fruition, we are going to lose control over our zoning, and we have to keep fighting any way we can do that, whether it be with state legislature or internally. Thank you, Mike, to uh, Mr. Mimora. And uh, thank you once again, Representative Basabi, for being with us today. So, recently, many have asked about the, they've questioned the lack of transparency in the city's RFB bidding process. Mr. Gungora, how would you advocate for the city to create a more competitive bidding process that would also be inclusive of the residents? This is interesting, and obviously with Nikki Beach being in the news constantly, people have been concerned about the RFP process. Personally, I think we should do a longer process on these projects that give people trust in the process and don't question the motivations of the commission. Right now, there really isn't a bright line rule on how RFPs work. It's really up to the commission to determine. Typically, when I sat there, the city manager, administration, and legal team would bring us a proposal, and it was seldomly tweaked, if ever, by the commission. Recently, we've seen shorter and shorter ones. So I think the first course of action would be to have a lengthier RFP process. Number two, 
Now, the first step of business is there's an evaluation committee appointed by the city manager. Typically, the commissioners get the proposed list. If some of us have a comment, we email back. But I think it would be helpful to have more residents on the evaluation committee so that there would be more transparency and reliability in that process. Finally, I think depending on the specific RFP, because some are not as exciting as others, some are over buying new uniforms for the lifeguards. People don't get all excited about that one. But I think sometimes when it involves a lengthy city lease or an item of particular interest to the community, that it would be beneficial to have a public charrette where people could come personally and speak on the item. So as mayor, I hear you. I see what's going on, and I would guarantee to you that I would create a longer process, a more transparent process, and a more resident-involved process. The reason, I, I live a block away from Nikki Leach, and I can tell you that I think more people have reached out to me about this than any other issue, uh, specific issue, in this campaign. And I went over there and, and listened to the folks who were the current leaseholders, and it became clear to me that when a 400-page proposal goes out, without any public input in advance. That's the issue. It's not about having public input at the end. They created the documents that said how you qualify for the application without any public input. There were a few meetings here or there, but at the end of the day, it was kind of just done, and then everybody's now trying to play catch up. If you read that document, which it's very lengthy, it doesn't have a lot of the things that a lot of folks would probably want. And that's the problem. So that public input process needs to happen before you put it out to bid, before you go into the code of silence, especially on major issues where you got one of the, if not arguably, the most expensive piece of property that this city owns. That property on the market is worth hundreds of millions of dollars if the city were to have it appraised. I don't think it was ever appraised as part of this entire process. So the process was flawed from the beginning. I can't speak to whether or not the end result is going to be the best result. I'm not on the commission, that's not my decision to make, but I'm going to inherit as your mayor, whatever that end result is, but I can assure you moving forward that on significant bidding processes like this, there will be significant public input. And I took my door off, we went to the transparency, I took my door off the hinges when I got elected both on the commission and to the state legislature because I want people to come in any time that they want to talk to me on any issue, and on issues this big, they should be able to do the same thing. I love this question, because I have consistently voted against the no bid, the lack of competitive processing. I will actually say, there's a lot of issues in our city, and we talk about public safety. But really, in my humble opinion, one of the biggest failures of our city right now is this bidding process. And I have taken so many, if you go back and look, probably 15, 20, I lost count, votes where I am the only one, 6-1 votes, saying I am not going to vote for this because there's lack of competitive bidding. So what happened to Nikki Beach is a perfect prime example. And hopefully uh, I've written about this, but just to remind you, when that was first put on the commission agenda, it was on the consent agenda, which means there's about 50 items. Without it being pulled by anyone, any commissioner or the mayor can pull it, it gets passed through. This was a 30-day window for the vendor, Boucher Brothers, who, by the way, have no issues with them winning. They might have won anyway, but if we had done it, you would have had more faith in the process. So it was a 30-day window for them to negotiate. I pulled it from consent, so now we had to force a vote, and it passed anyway, 5-2. I was one of the, one of the, and there was one, Commissioner Fernandez also voted against it. So it was 5-2. So then it comes back. The commission, there was such an outrage from you all, it comes back to put it out for bid. But then it was a 60-day window, and I voted no to that again, because it should have been 120 days. Or I said at a minimum 90 days, but it was 60 days. And then ultimately, we came back the last meeting, and I voted no again, because to me, and I said this, the process was tainted from the beginning. And I know Commissioner Dominguez also voted no as well, as she's here. And that was the issue. I wasn't even getting to the merits of who should get it. It's just the process was tainted from the beginning. And by the way, you know what's funny on this Nikki Beach? When I first pulled it and I voted no, somebody very high level, somebody you all know by name, called me and said, 
Commissioner, I don't understand you. You just upset so many people. You upset one of the biggest vendors in our city. Why would you do that? Nobody's going to notice. Oh, everybody noticed. Everybody noticed. And I am an independent. I don't have a PAC. And it's illegal in Miami Beach to take money from vendors, special interests, lobbyists. And since I don't have a PAC, I can't take the money anyway. Thank you. Okay, I can sum up. Uh, Stephen, could you read me there, please? It's mostly the days, the people in the city. I, I do think that the most unfortunate thing about this terrible process with Nikki Beach is one of the commissioners actually said, we're going to stick with the hometown boys. Can you imagine anyone who is planning on investing in Miami Beach and sees that? They won't invest. Yeah, it's just part of the influence peddling. The tip, the, the, you do this and I do that, and it just personifies Miami Beach as not a serious city. We're a billion dollar budget now, and by the way, a billion dollar budget is less than the budget that I had as a CEO. I know how to do budgets, but it requires a 24 7 mayor. That's never been done before. Mayors and commissioners, they have other jobs. I don't know if anyone's ever focused on this. You're too busy. I'm 24-7. It's not a stepping stone. This job to something else. I will give it everything. I will go vertical 24-7. Another thing I'd like to comment when he says the mayor sets the agenda, and he's absolutely right. I'm hearing so many things about Tallahassee. I almost think maybe you should go back to Tallahassee. Right? It's we lost our swagger. We have lost our swagger. Miami Beach. That's above its weight. Can we have our mojo back, please? Please, can we just do that? We don't have to do all the things that Tallahassee says, and we don't have to keep going up to Tallahassee. We know where Tallahassee is. I want to stay in Miami Beach. Next question. Mr. Grieco is about Lummis Park. In 1917, Lummis Park was sold to the city of Miami Beach with this deed restriction. I'll give you a chance to respond to, to what was said. The property herein conveyed to the town of Miami Beach is conveyed exclusively for park purposes and shall never be used for commercial or residential purposes. I'd, we'd like to know what is your vision for the future use, preservation, and or development of Lummis Park, and how would you lead the commissioners towards your vision? 10 sure. seconds for rebuttal, and then please answer the question. Sure. Over the last four years, I spent 250 days in Tallahassee, which is probably more time than Bill spent in Miami Beach over the last 10 years, because he was in England. So, <laughs> maybe the uh, challenge is that I'd love to see his passport and show it to the elevator. That being said, at least I have a passport. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you have a British passport. Uh, hey, Lummis Park. Thank you. There should be no development in Lummis Park, period, end of story. So I've heard all these different ideas about activations. I've heard about ideas about Ferris wheels and all sorts of things that we want to do in Lummis Park. Leave it alone. There are deep restrictions to it. I don't know anybody that would want to develop on that. The activation should be kept simple. We have a few things during our basil, we have a few things during some of the other events, but other than that, it should be kept simple, it should be kept passive, it should not be activated more than it already is, probably even less, and we should just be patrolling it better, and we've got the park rangers there, I created the park ranger program, and we've seen a huge decrease in any sort of negative or criminal activity since the creation of the park rangers, but realistic spe realistically speaking, I don't see why we should, why should, we should do anything more with Lomas Park, other than keeping it the way that it is. Yeah, I agree. I think the question is more, we have a lot of activations out in here in Lewis Park, and actually Irene and Jane are the leading voices in our city right now of trying to limit that. And ultimately, we as commissioners, we need to be lit. Well, some of these things are not even decided by vote. They're decided by the city manager, but the city manager ultimately reports to us. So we are the ones who need to give the direction of how our city goes. And I, when residents speak, I listen loudly. Actually, yesterday at Miami Beach United, a couple of people pointed out 
there were five commission candidates. One was not feeling well, so it wasn't there. And three of their question was, who, which commissioner, current commissioner, would you model yourself after? And three out of the five mentioned me. So I took that as a, a, a I was very honored and, and, uh, and thrilled to hear that. But because I do, I, I come to every neighborhood association meeting, I am listening. So I actually had a proposal a couple of years ago, which they were not fond of, to bring a high-end miniature golf, Art Deco motif, toward the southern end of Ocean Drive, in the spoil area, which our legal department and everyone had told me was outside of the limits of Loomis Park, so it didn't violate that fee. But ultimately, I got feedback from our residents who were not fond of the idea, and I dropped it. I dropped it because ultimately that's who I'm your voice. And if that's not what people want, then that's not, that's not what you're going to get. So that, that's done with. But ultimately, I think we need to give a reason for residents, and I mentioned it before, how do we get people coming here? Because once we get our residents throughout our city to come here, everything changes, not only from our residents, but from our tourists. So actually, an idea, I'll give Jane the credit, was uh, we do have a very good uh, sort of muscle beach. I have an idea now, an initiative to bring like a water pot that came from, uh, from Jane to try to bring in, again, the, the families and, and, and little kids, really try to incentivize uh, bringing people here other than just to go to, uh, to, to the bars. So I think it's sacrosanct. I don't think we're going to have any development on Lucas Park. We can uplift it, beautify it, help with the homeless. We have one of the sponsors of legislation as well to try to limit the amount of homeless individuals camping down in our city. Thanks. Thank you. Mr. Sure. Rody? Yeah, uh, I'm going to come back to Mike. And Mike, I agree with you on Park Rangers. Got to keep them off balance, right? I agree with Mike on Park Rangers. Activation. We, we, yeah, we got to be smarter about this. Spring Break had the three stages. This is the story I like to hear. I'd like to tell. And I went to, I walked Spring Break every single day because I live right there. I do Ocean Drive every day of the year. And so I looked, went in front of each of the three activation music. And there was a CNW. I got a music background on MTV, but we also had CMT, Country Music Television. So I'm listening to the band. I'm, look, I'm thinking, this is a pretty good CMT band. What's the problem? And I looked around, and there were only four people. Only four people. The city spent $3 million on the activations. It didn't work. So I'm very reluctant about back the activations unless it's much smarter. There was the, the recent, I see this is, sometimes things are good. There was the little stands that were along the walkway, and some people liked them, residents didn't like them. And they were eliminated by the movement from the residents of this South Beach. So that's a good result, and that, that worked. But I do think it's not one size fits all. When you have air and sea, for example, Memorial Day, I don't know, I'm the guy, yeah, I'm a little biased. I liked the military activation. That worked. I wouldn't do a blanket on activation, but I would be very careful about approving any activation. Thank you, Mr. Kimborn. Oh, she liked it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, no, nobody in their right mind would support development on Loomis Park. If that is your land, we will fight and we will protect that from development. So then let's talk about commercialization. I'm opposed to it. There's been some bad ideas. There's a low-end market that didn't work that was done here that the city had to cancel. There was an idea from a commissioner, one of my opponents, to bring in a no-bid deal for like a pup pump course uh, on Loomis Park, which also I think is a bad idea. I think we really need to focus on high-end activations. What do I mean by that? There's stuff that doesn't work. Does anybody remember last spring break, that inflatable, boozy, bounce thing they put on with a bar? All right, it looked like it belonged in the low-end festival. That we do not need. There are things that we need to make our city better. I mentioned earlier, things that work. Art Basel works. People like those art tents in the park. It's become part of our identity and our brand. The wine and food festival works. So we have to look at opportunities for high-end, high-level activations that the community wants to participate in. So I mentioned in my opening one that I love is a light festival, like we see in Leon, France. I think that would be great and work with what we have there, our beautiful historic buildings. They've done kind of a smaller version at the Betsy before, which was gorgeous. And I also saw a small version at a fish called Avalon. Not surprisingly, two of our better businesses. Um, I would continue to support 
park space. I voted and co sponsored many events to augment Muscle Beach, which I think is great, to increase our volleyball courts, which is great, to enhance the park uses there. That's what I foresee for that area. And light it up and keep it clean and safe. Thank you. You can give the mic to Commissioner Minor. And before we go to the next question, I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank Laura Dominguez. Commissioner Laura Dominguez, thank you so much for coming. Our next question is about law enforcement, and we will be starting with Commissioner Minor. Though we all agree that police officers have very overwhelming and difficult jobs, and for the most part, we do have adequate laws on the books that promote our safety. Residents, especially in the ADCD, still feel that officers could be more visible, proactive, and consistent when it comes to enforcement of these laws. Commissioner Minor, keeping in mind the budget, how would you work with the city manager to enable the police to effectively enforce misdemeanors such as disturbing the peace, open container laws, and vagrancy, as well as addressing the higher level crimes including drug dealing, even human trafficking, all of which impact our quality of life. This is the reason I'm running for mayor. This, this very question is the reason. So first of all, the day after I was inaugurated, I sat with our then police chief, and I asked him, tell me how many officers are on the street at any given moment. It's 24. First of all, I don't see 24 when I go out. But, okay, that's it. But, Based on the numbers that we have, 416, and some of them are civilians, a lot of detectives, there's a lot of hierarchy. But still, if you look at the numbers that the Department of Justice puts out, we are on the high end. We are on the high end of offices per capita, and that's accounting for the tourism. Not to say I wouldn't be supportive of adding more, but I don't think that's the issue. I don't think that's the issue. You've got to fix what we have now, and that is more visibility. And it's the biggest deterrent to crime. If you ask anybody who, any chief, anybody who studies this, any, any, any analytics, to turn to crime is having the offices visible. You walk down Ocean Drive, this should be our Times Square. I don't want to, maybe not the perfect comparison, but you go to Times Square, there's cops everywhere. You don't see that here. You don't see that here. So that's one issue. Second, as I mentioned, I transformed our municipal prosecution team, 8% success rate. And I passed a series of legislation requiring our prosecutors to prosecute. And we're at 87% today. I also took away some of the misdemeanors from the state attorney's office, and, and that's three of them. And at the next commission meeting, again, it was on the commission meeting, this agenda, it didn't get heard. That is a problem. Instead of having two hours of proclamations and an hour plus on the Hall of Fame, no, I'm serious. We should be discussing this. And by the way, when, when I initially brought the item to take away misdemeanors from the state attorney's office, they're bombarded. They have felonies. They have 34 cities. Our commission initially voted me down. I actually had to do the research and come up. I spent hours and hours. That couldn't even get access to the database until they said I was the first and only elected official that actually asked for permission to have the database to be able to do the research to make sure that we are not only visible and making the arrests when necessary, but also possibly what you said, Steve. I don't know about that. Uh, I can be a mentor to all of these, and they're going to be part of my team when I become mayor because they have some good things to offer. So I can work with them. So, you know what I do? So I will. I think she's a baby. <laughs> what I would do is obviously work with the city manager, but as a CEO, it's hard to hold back. So I would go for it. But the mayor doesn't mean that. No offense to the mayor, because I have a lot of respect for him, and we should thank him for his public service as his term is coming to an end. But he doesn't meet with the police on a weekly basis. I would. I would the police chief. I would meet with the police chief on a weekly basis, because it's essential that the mayor and the police chief are totally aligned. We have had crime. I don't care what the city says. I don't care what the statistics say. We all know we have a crime problem. We just had the Lincoln Road, the, the surf, by the Miami Beach girls. You, I'm sure you read about it. They pummeled the poor person who was running the shop on Lincoln Road. On 41st Street, a gang comes in, people having a uh, dining at the steak grill, and they yell up at knife point to rob them. 
We've seen the murders on Ocean Drive. How about the tragic one of the family where the guy comes across and shoots the father in front of his wife and his son. The son is now, he's going to be without a father and the wife was, is, is a widow. We witnessed gun shooting on 72nd Street, all three sections. Public safety is number one. We're nowhere. We have an identity crisis here, but we're going to fix that. But the first thing we got to fix is make sure this community is safe. Public safety is my number one issue in running for office, and nobody has the demonstrated experience that I have over many years. As a young commissioner, I started placing a regular recurring item before committee, what they now call the Public Safety Committee, where I had the police chief or a high-level person come in and report to me as a commissioner. As mayor, I would take that to the next level. I meet regularly with our police chief, even not being on the commission, as well as our police leadership, to make sure that we are where we need to be. I've earned the endorsement and the support of our Miami Beach police officers because they trust me to be your law and order candidate and to implement the changes we need. My last year on the commission, we upped the budget for the police. We created additional positions because we need them. We added money for video camera installation because we need it. We need a real-time crime sensor. We need to have the police out there. And part of what we needed was a trust issue. And the police trust me. I tell them, we've given you your tools. We've given you the positions. We've given you the money. We've given you technology. Now we need you to walk the streets, be visible on bicycles, and give us the proactive policing that our residents demand. I will give you that as mayor. I'm also going to make sure that we implement other tools. This area needs lighting. I mentioned that in my opening. Lighting deters criminal activity. Right now, there are parts of this area that quite frankly feel dangerous. It's like an attractive nuisance. So besides these other policing issues, I'm going to work with our city to give this area that safe feeling and that lighting that we need. And finally, I've walked Ocean Drive probably more than anyone. It's a regular part of my repertoire, so to speak. I'm here weekly, as I am in other areas of our city, to personally see and hear and be a part of what's going on. And as your mayor, I'm going to give you that same commitment, that I will be there on the front line. So speaking of the front line, I'm going to go back to you. What have you done? What are you going to do? And how are you going to do it? What have I done? I served six years as a prosecutor in the state attorney's office, gangs and narcotics, putting people away for hundreds and hundreds of years, long time investigations. That's what I did. As your commissioner, again, I created the Park Ranger program. We essentially eliminated crime in all of our parks, and that program keeps growing year after year. What else did I do? I brought the RNC show here. The worst weekend every year in the city of Miami Beach for 17 years. I came up with the solution, implemented the solution. It cost the city zero dollars. We went from hundreds of arrests to dozens in one year. And we do it every year. And I'm glad that several of my opponents think it was a great idea. It was, because it worked. Because when I knocked on doors in 2013, that was the thing that everybody brought up. What are you going to do about Memorial Day? And I fixed it. What are you going to do about spring break is now the next conversation. What are you going to do and how are you going to do it? I'm going to make it really hard to park. Now let me explain what that means. Not for residents, not for employees, but 95% of the crimes, violent crimes that are committed here are committed by people that drive from outside our city, park their personal vehicles, bring their drugs over, bring their guns over, bring over half their garage and all their coolers and everything else, and they essentially spend no money in our city, and they terrorize residents and tax, our taxpayers, our residents, our hotel guests. That is the problem. It's not just about police. It's about reducing the size of the crowds and increasing the size of the quality crowds that actually spend money in our city. <laughs> So for our seventh question, Mr. Rohde, so 
along with safety. We also have quality of life issues that are addressed by our code enforcement officers who also have very overwhelming and difficult jobs. Again, keeping in mind the budget. Two-parter, would you direct code enforcement and how, if you would, enable them to be more proactive in the following ways? Controlling noise from businesses, encouraging building owners to better maintain their properties, and routinely checking for valid operating permits such as BTRs and alcohol sales permits. Those are the three things. Yeah, uh, thank you. Yeah, it's interesting. You've mentioned budget a couple of times. And we have nearly a billion dollars in our budget. This is a very wealthy community. And we have come out and supported a 10% increase in resources for the police, including the code enforcement. Code enforcement, however, is not just about resources. It's about discipline. I led troops in combat in Vietnam. I commanded nuclear missile bases. I served 11 years as an airborne cleaner. I know discipline, and I know how to motivate troops. And it's not that different from police. I'm not saying our police has a morale problem, but my phrase was always, you're more likely to take the hill if you want to take the hill. There's too many of our police and code enforcement who are sitting in cars or coffee shops or Starbucks. we got to get out. We got to up our game. We got to not take it up a notch. When you have the noise pollution, we've all seen it. I was on what Collins going to Shabbat, and we got tangled up with two Lamborghinis. Like two Lamborghinis that were racing on Collins Avenue. That's sense. We've all seen it. We've seen drug trafficking. We've seen gun violence on the streets. And it's not just code enforcement. It's the police. I realize you're focusing on code. But code enforcement means a lot. Why? Everyone's heard of the broken windows or the broken glass, which happened in New York in the 90s. You start low, and then it bubbles up. You get the low crimes first, and that's what code enforcement does. And then naturally, it bubbles up to create a safer environment for the whole community. Good issues obviously impact our quality of life. And like police, we do need to be more proactive. Code has a couple of hindrances in that we used to be able to anonymously report code complaints, but the state preempted that. You now have to give a name, a number, and identify yourself. I don't really know if you have to give your name, but you have to give a name. But I think the code needs to be proactively out there as well, because there's a number of violations that are visible to us when we walk there. You can tell buildings that need to be painted or that have exterior issues that bring down the value of the street for the residents and actually the other property owners that are doing a good job of maintaining their blocks. Clearly noise is an issue, not just here, but throughout the city. Here it's a little bit more focused on music, but in other parts of the city, you have traffic issues where I live up in Mid-Beach, we have issues with people on bicycles blaring music on their boom boxes while we're trying to walk down the beach walk. So we definitely need to be more proactive. As well, my final year on the commission, we did enhance the budget to bring in more code employees. So they are supposed to be proactively enforcing not only these visible violations, but also Airbnb short-term rental violations, something else that I'm very concerned about cracking down on. Yes, we will have them there. Additionally, while I didn't have this as a recurring item every month or every other month, I did require code to come out frequently when I was on the Neighborhoods Committee and when I chaired it previously in the past to give us reports. I think it's important to have that dialogue. I have a close relationship with our code director as I do with all the directors because when I see things, I call him. He's, you now have to identify yourself. I'm like, fine, put my name out there because it is happening. So I encourage you all to work with us and to also assist us. You're there when we can't be. Call in issues to code. Assist us, make our city better by being a part of the process to make it better. And I'll get you the code staff to make sure that we get things done. Thank you. So, so when that wall passed that said that you can't anonymously, I was looking at my kid now, uh, that you can't anonymously file a code complaint. 
I've had a lot of people ask me, what am I supposed to do? I don't want my, my neighbor upset with me. You know what I said? Call me. Call me. Just call me. Call me on WhatsApp. Call me whatever. Send me a text. I'll make it. And if I have to do that as the raise your hand if you have my cell phone. Raise your hand. I'm raising your hand. There it is. It's about half the room. I count it. And the other, there's a few people that are not admitting that they have my cell phone for some reason. It's important. I give it to everyone. And before you leave, I encourage you, please come up to me. I will give you my personal cell phone number. If I'm lucky enough to be your mayor, I humbly ask, well, call me. Whether it be about a code complaint or just a complaint in general, I'm more than willing to entertain it and I'm more than willing to make the complaint for you because the problem that we have, and, and former Commissioner Gugora made a good point, that we need to be more proactive. Whether it be our police or our code enforcement officers. We have been living in a complaint driven, reactive model, and it needs to stop. And I keep bringing up the park rangers because you know what I did? I made them certified code enforcement officers in addition to being parks employees. I wrote the script because I wanted more code enforcement officers with eyes and ears, not in cars, on bicycles, going around near and in our parks, just like we have our code enforcement officers that are supposed to be out and about. So that's what we need. We need Boots on the ground, eyes up and down. We need ears and noses out and about, not in the cars. We need preemptive, proactive solutions, and we need to be able to enforce things without it being somebody calling it in every time. Thank you, Mr. Martin. You know, I actually get a lot of complaints and I do call them in, but the problem is a lot of people don't know to call the commissioner, so it's good. It helps to some degree. But actually, and I mentioned earlier, there was a shooting this week on 47th and Alton. Eight shots were fired, Thank thankfully nobody was injured. I actually was involved with that for about probably six months because the person who's next door was complaining about this home and actually had said to me a couple months ago, there's going to be a shooting that happens based on the people who are using this as an Airbnb. And he was right. But what's the problem? I'm not even blaming our city so much. Actually, code was really even, in fact, code compliance was there at the time because they were doing it undercover. But the problem is, they didn't have, the, based on what we are interpreting the law to be, they were saying, unless the person admits to actually violating the law, they are not. They can't enforce the law. And that's what I mentioned earlier, that I'm looking into legislation. A lot of it's not legislation. I told you it's administrative, how we do things. This one might be, that we need to make sure that we're cracking down on this without having somebody admit there's a problem. But it's really, it's the focus of the administration. So I brought an initiative probably a year and a half ago. We are one of the only cities, I think there's only three or four cities in the United States that actually have noise meters in different parts of the city. We have three. It was an initiative I brought. I was doing some research and I saw this and we brought it. But I can tell you, it's not working because there's no desire to make it work. They, I got fought tooth and nail. They didn't want to bring it. I had to fight for it. I had to bring it four times to the commission to finally get our city administration and the police department to sign off on it. They're not in the right locations. And this is part of the problem. If you don't have the desire, you can have all the legislation in the world. You're not going to get things passed. And I'll tell you one other thing the mayor does quickly that, is, that, that separates the mayor from the commissioners. They appoint people to the committees. I had a lighting item that I brought for this area. It passed our Public Safety Neighborhoods Quality of Life Committee, which I'm the chair of, 3-0. It could not get out of the Finance Department, it could, the Finance Committee. It couldn't get out of it, so we never got to commission. The, the mayor must, and I would, appoint the people who are resident-friendly to make sure that we get things through the commission. Thank you. Thank you. Well, our last question at this time, we will start with Mr. Miller. Day one in office, what will be your first commission agenda item, and how will you gain a consensus of support? Great question. I already told you public safety is my number one item, so I would put a measure on the agenda for the police chief and the police leadership to come before us and issue a report and make sure that we have proper implementation of a proactive policing plan coupled with a discussion of what's coming for spring break because it's looming right around the corner after that December meeting. And I'm honored to have the support of all three remaining city commissioners. Something that you need. A lot of the mayoral candidates like to tell you, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. But in truth, you're the chair of a body. And I'm honored to have that support so that I will be able to push through my agenda. 
So there will be public safety. It will be proactive policing. It will be representing back to us what they're doing through multiple neighborhoods. It will be a discussion of lighting and how we are using technology to make our city safer. And it will be a discussion on spring break. Because as we said here today, I know that there's increased funding. There's an increased policing plan. But I'm not really sure what else we're going from there. And I want to make sure that my first spring break as your mayor, I deliver the safest spring break you've seen in many years. And it's my goal. No shootings, no drama, no CNN. That's my promise to you on day one. Thank you. Again, day one. What would be your first commission agenda item, and how will you gain consensus of support? Okay, so my first agenda item, I don't see how I would not get consensus for this. I essentially want to take a wrecking ball to the building. So I want to change the way we handle permitting in this city. I want to change the way that you can open up a business, the way you can change a window in your house. Because I'll tell you this, one of the reasons that we have public safety problems in this town is because we have so many empty storefronts. Whether it be on Lincoln Road, whether it be crappy businesses on Ocean Drive or Collins, or the fact that half of Washington Avenue is vacant right now, it's because nobody wants to do business. Because it takes three times longer in the city of Miami Beach to open up a business than it does anywhere else in Dade County and in South Florida. And everybody knows it. Nobody wants to invest here right now. Wynwood, Design District, Coconut Grove, Coral Gables, Doral, Ripple, they're running circles around us right now. We need to start thinking about economics, not just about high in the sky conversations about public safety that have proven to not work over the years. We need to talk about economics and get positive foot traffic back in our city. I have been living here for almost 25 years and it hasn't always been like this. I used to work on Washington Avenue. I own part of a restaurant in South Beach. I'm the only one up here who's actually a business owner in the city of Miami Beach. And I can tell you right now, it is almost impossible to open unless you're the Cheesecake Factory. And they're a publicly traded company. But if you're a mom and pop, or even a mid-level business, you're bleeding, you're in the red by the time you open, because you've been paying rent for months. So my first item, and I don't see any world in where I'm not gonna get consensus for this, whether I'm endorsed by commissioners or not, because it makes sense, it is a citywide issue, and you wanna talk about solving crime and getting rid of bad headlines, that is how you do it. He's right about the building department, but I'll go in a different direction, so I'm not copycatting. <laughs> I've had an item on for a couple of years. It sounds simple. I want to know every arrest made in Miami Beach. And guess what? I do not have that information. I can't even get called half the time to get on. But I do not have that information. And guess what? There's that a single person in our city right now, not one person, who knows, other than our municipal prosecution team that I told you about, we handle some of the misdemeanors. There's not a single person in our city who knows what happens after an arrest is made and goes to the state attorney's office. That's incredible to me. We don't even know whether we're being effective, if the cases are being prosecuted, what's happening afterwards. That needs to change. I'll tell you what else needs to change. So we've had a couple of meetings since our new police chief came on. By the way, our, our former police chief told me once, a couple of years ago, so this is not an indictment on any current commissioners, because it might be different people. But he told me once, because I literally speak to our police chief every day, sometimes multiple times. And he told me, he goes, Commissioner, I didn't know this. I just assumed this was standard. He goes, most of your colleagues I've never had a conversation with outside of the commission meeting. That was shocking to me. That was actually really shocking. This is the most important, other than the city manager, and obviously he's the most important person, in my opinion, in our city, the police chief. And yet, people aren't even interacting with him or her, but him in this case. Couple of keys, last few meetings, police chief has not spoken at our commission meeting. The sanitation director, I can't remember the sanitation director ever speaking at a commission meeting. Sometimes our public works director who handles lighting, don't remember in the last time he spoke about lighting. Our code enforcement, I can't remember the last time our director or assistant director spoke at a commission meeting. Our meetings, our commission meetings should start with those four people. What do you care about every day? You care about public safety, clean streets, lighting, and code enforcement, and yet we're not hearing from any of them. That's where the priorities need to change, and that's what would happen under my leadership, because again, the mayor does set the agenda, and that's the things we're gonna talk about, and you're gonna to listen to and hear about. In a timely manner, so we don't make people wait eight hours before their items fall. 
I think everyone can agree on the permitting. We've all had experiences with their own heard stories about it. Yeah, we got to fix that. I don't think I have one. I would do 10 on the first day. And first. Uh, yesterday. Priority. 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 It's so demoralizing the way these firemen are living and spending their time. And it's like there's no training available. The, the, uh, the facilities look terrible. I think it's a threat to the citizens of Miami Beach, a safety threat. And why the city hasn't gotten behind this sooner is beyond me. This is not only a morale factor. I think it's potentially a dangerous situation. The fire department's not just fires. There are the fire and rescue trucks we see every day. And they're out there, their response time is still great. They're amazing, and we owe them so much gratitude, but we gotta get them a new firehouse. The other thing I'll say quickly, since I have some time here, commission meetings. If you're thinking about watching a commission meeting online, my recommendation is don't do it unless you bring your antidepressants. It's the most dysfunctional meeting I have ever seen in my life. Hours spent on the Hall of Fame, hours on proclamations, and not even invading the issue. Thank you for <laughs> Anyway, that's what I would do. Don't watch the commission. Thank you. The next question is going to start. Mr. Grieco. So we're actually going to move to our third segment in the form of a lightning round. And for the sake of time, we're going to tweak it a little bit. We've got two questions. and. We are going to allow for 15 seconds so that you can give us the clearest and most concise response, okay? So the first one, Mr. Grieco, do you support the current configuration of the Ocean Drive Promenade, and what is your ultimate desire for Ocean Drive's traffic pattern? Full pedestrianization, full two-way traffic, or three, the existing configuration that includes the permanent pedestrian promenade? Of course, I'm going to come up with a fourth option. My fourth option is to make it a flex. In Europe, retractable bollards all throughout major cities. Now, I'm fine with the current configuration, but there does need to be some flexibility depending on the events that we have or traffic flow. So we should, and we did have a plan to have retractable bollards all throughout Ocean Drive, so you can change the configuration at any time. Commissioner Reiner. So I've been a big supporter of the... The, ocean, the promenade on the northern end, it's been a battle. It's been a battle on our commission. I'm a big proponent of that. I don't often make decisions based on litigation, but we did get sued by the hotels, and that is an aspect. We have to be careful on this one. I am comfortable with the current configuration, but always listening to our residents if we can do Thank better. You. Sure. Definitely a problem. There's no equivocation on this. I have a vision to make this unbelievable street the most beautiful promenade in promenade, excuse me, promenade, promenade, in the world. And it can be done, it just has to be shut from traffic. As far as the business and the hotels, we gotta think long term. Any business on Ocean Drive will improve if you beautify it with just pedestrians. I voted for the current configuration before I left the commission at the end of 21, and it's got issues that we'll fix, but it's more or less working. It allows for a promenade on the residential side with one lane of traffic reintroduced. Also, at the beginning of COVID, I introduced the full pedestrianization because we needed it at that time. People needed to be outdoors. We needed to have the outdoor seating for our Thank restaurants you. and cafes. It's Commissioner Miner, you get the next question first. Okay. And the question is, do you support a 2 a.m. or a 5 a.m. shutdown for alcohol sales? Every time it's come up, I voted for 2 a.m. I've never not voted for 2 a.m., so that's pretty clear. I'm a 2 a.m. I'm a 2 a.m.er. Whether it be residential areas, whether it be here, and again, as we make that transformation to who we are, I think I think 2 a.m. is sufficient. And again, I'm going to keep voting that way. It's the way I've always voted. Thank you, Mr. Wright. 2 a.m. I will say, however, there may be exceptions on Washington for nightclubs. We're not going to do away with all that. 
but yes, 2 a.m. has to be done. And I've checked it out with the police department. They say it's not a silver bullet, but it's another thing that we have in the pocket that can help control the chaos in, in spring break. Mr. That's important point, guys. Um, number one, we're city that needs different structure in different areas. So I support 2 a.m. rollback in residential neighborhoods, just as it's happening south of Fifth. I support it Sunset Harbor, 41st, West Avenue. But I don't think you need a cookie cutter issue for the whole city. So I think I support both. Thank you. Mr. Baker? I'm 2 a.m. moving forward. What that means is I'm not in the business of putting people out of business and putting people out of jobs. So if you're an existing 5 a.m. business, you can get grandfathered in, but moving forward, no more 2 a.m. businesses. And if a 5 a.m. business closes, it has to reopen as a 2 a.m. business. Great. Thank you. Thank you all. We're moving now to our final segment. And we'd like to give the candidates an opportunity to leave us with some closing words. And we'd like to start with Mr. Rohde. Okay, thank you. First, I'd like to thank you all, your engaged citizens. This is exactly what the city needs. You come here and you listen and you engage. We need everybody to be like you. Thank you for all that. And your dedication is purely noted. And I want to thank you too, even though you stole me quite a bit. But you, but you held a good form. The only thing I'll say for the two of you, used to being stolen. I have a disciplinary wife. <laughs> okay. Vision. It's all about identity. What does Miami Beach want to be? And it's about vision and strategic plan. We don't have it yet. And I'm about vision. A vision and then a strategy, a strategic plan, and then an implementation plan. I dream about Miami Beach being the safest city in the world. I dream about Miami Beach being the most innovative city in the world. Setting the example, how to stop the seas. We're on the front lines. We are the most adaptable and innovative. I dream Miami Beach will be the leader in arts and culture as a gateway from Latin America and will set the example for the world. And I believe that Miami Beach is on the cusp of greatness. I've been to every coastal city in the world. Miami Beach is the best, and we're going to make it number one. Thank you. We all have dreams, but when you come to vote for me, you need a leader that can make those dreams into a reality. I am that leader. There's no question if you were hiring for a job, you want the most experienced person with the most commitment, who's been there the longest, and who's gotten things done. If that's what you want, then vote for Gora. I have lived in this county my entire life. I've lived on the beach since 92. I've been committed every step of the way. I served three elected terms. Nobody else has done that. I have a record of doing things for you all, and we need somebody that can take it to the next step. And with the endorsement of all of the remaining commissioners, supporting my vision and my platform, that dream of a better Miami Beach will make it a reality. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. So at the beginning and in the middle, I keep talking about what have you done what are you going to do and how are you going to do it? I'll add how long have you lived here to just throw that out there as well. But I'll tell you this. There are some people up here who sound like they're running for the CEO or city manager. That's not an elected position. There are other people up here who sound like they're running for police chief. That is also not an elected position. I'm Mike Rico, and I am running for mayor. And I'm humbly asking for your vote for the folks that may watch this on the tape later. I have served as your commissioner. I have served as your state representative. I have served six years locally as a prosecutor. The most important job that I have, if you're watching TV right now, is being the dad of this 14 year old. And he's the reason that I'm working. You guys are secondary to him. But at the same time, I am looking to have 85,000 new bosses. That's how many residents we have. I want you all to be my boss. I want you all to be able to call me. I want you all to know that I am there for you. My name is Mike Rico, and I am running for. So we talked about how the mayor sets the agenda, gets to pick the committees, but it's also the interaction. Like I said, three out of the five candidates yesterday, Miami Beach United, picked the, the resident friendly, and the, you're going to see the change. Under my leadership, you would see those meetings would be completely different. 
by the way, one of the questions was, would you get the support? I get the support for my items because they're good items. Commissioners are reasonable people. You all elected good people. And if you bring up a good item that makes sense and is logical and is going to help our residents, you're going to get the votes. That's why I always get the votes for my items. The other thing is, the other thing that I must keep in, in, in perspective, first of all, I've answered 50,000, over 50,000 emails. I personally do it. I read every email, every text. I answer them. And also, transparency. City contracts were not available publicly. They are now because of an item I brought initiative. City audits, conditional use permits, working on a commercial map of development projects. Transparency is so important. That's why the competitive bidding process, I've taken a hard line on it every time to make sure that you have that access and you have that competitive process. I'll continue to do that and it's going to permeate our entire city. Thank, thank you. you. And thank you all. So this concludes the Q&A portion of our forum and we would like to now give the audience an opportunity to mingle with the candidates and get to know them better. I want to thank you all for participating and joining us this evening and we look forward to these discussions with our newly elected officials. Have a great night everybody.